Um, so thank you all of you for joining us here today. My name is Amy Lingo. I'm the interim dean here in the College of Education and Human Development at the University of Louisville. I, would, I thought I would start by sharing a little bit with you about the um, Nystrand Center for Excellence in Education, which is sponsoring today's panel. The Nystrand Center of Excellence in Education in the College of Education and Human Development at the University of Louisville is dedicated to the continual support of educational excellence for all students, made possible through innovative thinking, transformational educator preparation, professional development, and supportive learning environments. The Nystrand Center supports and facilitates education reform through its outstanding special programs and initiatives, strong community partnerships <clears throat> that are really at the heart of our success and serve as an inspiration for those who work so diligently to provide a better education for our children. It is our mission to continue with transformation through collaboration by leading the discussion on education reform, policy, research, and practice. I am happy to introduce to you Dr. Geneva Stark, who is the director of the Nystrand Center of Excellence in Education and a clinical assistant professor in educational leadership, evaluation, and organizational development here in our college. Dr. Stark comes to us from Jefferson County Public Schools, where she most recently served as a diversity, equity, and poverty administrator. Prior to this role, Dr. Stark served in JCPS as a district coordinator and human resource administrator, principal, and assistant principal. In addition, Dr. Stark was a KDE, Kentucky Association of School Administrators Superintendent Fellow, former president of the Kentucky Association of Secondary School Principals, and she is noted a, a noted educator, thought leader, and frequent pre presenter on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and implicit bias. Her commu community leadership is also impressive. She serves on the National Alliance of Black School Educators, Board of Directors, member of the Lego League of Women Voters, NAACP, the National Council of Negro Women, and is the former president of the Greater Louisville Alliance of Black School Educators. Dr. Stark is also a mem member of Senator Gerald Neal's African American Initiative. She is a volunteer for the Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals. She holds the P a PhD in Educational Leadership and Policy from the University of Louisville. She serves as a mentor to students, teachers, support staff, and administrators in JCPS, locally, statewide, and nationally. She is a true champion for education and is looking forward to leveraging her knowledge experiences as a K-12 educator, collaborator, motivator, team builder, and diversity consultant to focus on taking the Nystrand Center of Excellence in Education to the next level. So may I present to you, Dr. Geneva Stark. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lingo. Appreciate that, um, the opening, and, um, and also your leadership, you know, and I'm very honored to serve as a director of the Nystrand Center of Excellence in Education at the University of Louisville. And I want to commend the panelists for being here this morning, taking time out of your busy schedule because right now there's a lot that's going on in our country and our state and in our city um, because we are dealing with three pandemics you know, at this particular time. Um, not only are we dealing with COVID-19, but we are also dealing with the pandemic of racism and social justice and also the glaring disparities in our educational institutions. So again, welcome and thank you all for being here this morning. Um, truly appreciate it. And what, and to, um, in the essence of time, because we have a lot to cover this morning, and want to be able to allow you the opportunity to be able to reach out to your constituents from across the state. You know, so um, we have people from all parts of the, the, the Commonwealth of Kentucky that's eager to hear what are our educational leaders thinking? You know, what can they, how can they help us to move forward? What is their thinking? And so I thought it was an excellent opportunity to be able to hear from the thought leaders, you know, and the leaders in education in the Commonwealth of Kentucky to see how can we transform education through innovation? Because we cannot, many people think about going back. Well, it's not about going back, it's about how do we move forward? And how do we move forward collectively? How do we move forward in a collaborative and innovative way you know, as well. And so that's what the, what the goal is this morning to be able to hear, let, allow the constituents to hear from the education leaders. 
And so one of the things I'd like to do first is for everyone to be able to introduce themselves. You have two minutes to do that. And we're gonna start with um, our Lieutenant Governor Jacqueline Coleman and um, um, Ms. Coleman, uh, we met in Bullitt County while you were on the campaign trail. You know, So I'm happy and it's a pleasure for you to be here this morning. So um, your two minutes. <laughs> well, thank you. And, and it was an honor um, to meet you then and certainly an honor to be with you again here today. Um, I am actually in my chief of staff's office because my eight month old is in my office. Uh, she was asleep. So if you hear something, that means that she's not asleep anymore. <laughs> um, but I, it's an honor to be with all of you today. I think about uh, the, the, the places that education has, has been in Kentucky and we certainly have made strides forward. And then I think about how far we have to go. And the team that we have uh, in the Bashir Coleman administration is one that I would put up against any team. Um, the governor and I ran and he uh, believes in education so much that he picked a classroom teacher to run with him. And so that tells you where uh, Governor Bashir's priorities are. Uh, he also appointed me to serve as Secretary of Education and Workforce Development as Lieutenant Governor uh, to be able to um, help our administration to move forward in these ways. Uh, we have the uh, most qualified Board of Education in uh, at the state level in the nation. Uh, we That really uh, highly qualified board picked our new commissioner, Dr. Jason Glass, who is with us here today, and we snagged him back from Colorado. Um, and then all of you, I'm sure, know Aaron Thompson, his amazing story and, and the work that he's done around higher education uh, in Kentucky. So we have uh, quite a team assembled uh, and we are ready and willing to listen uh, and to meet with uh, all of the folks like, like you who are here today uh, to learn from you and to figure out how we can make this education system work for every single Kentucky child, regardless of their zip code, regardless of their socioeconomic status or any other identifier. Uh, all of us want an education uh, to serve. And we have to remember that uh, first and foremost, we are serving the kids in Kentucky, which they are the future of this Commonwealth. Uh, and it's with uh, that, that I would say that I'm honored to be here with all of you today. Hey, thank you very much. Um, appreciate it. And, um, and I guess uh, the lead in is to um, Dr. Aaron Thompson. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Starr. Good to see everybody on the Zoom. Uh, you know, the Lieutenant Governor led it off, I think, in a way that I'll just pick up. I think it is important for us to understand <clears throat> that when we talk about education, we're talking about education from a standpoint of looking at what we can do as a collective to get where we need to go. Uh, so uh, who I am, as you all know, as a old country boy from Clay County, first generation high school student and college student, deeply believe in all education, public education in particular. I make no bones about really as the head of higher education that what little time I have that I want to push several things. One is I want to push quality education in higher ed. But I'm also going to push quality education across the pipeline, P20 pipeline. I'm going to do that with equity in mind. I'm going to do that focusing on achievement gaps as well as opportunity gaps. I'm going to do that by good measurement, good assessment, knowing are we creating a continuous improvement model that makes us have a better system long after we're gone. I want to do this by being collaborative with uh, people like Jason Glass and Lieutenant Governor Coleman, but also with the Neely Bendabudis and the folk that I represent in higher ed. I think it's important that we not just talk about this. I think it's important that we really put forth a strategic agenda and a strategic plan and assessment plan to make sure we're getting there. It's important that we value teachers. It's important we value faculty. It's important that we value good deep curriculum. It's important that we value professional development at all levels. It's also important that we understand that we're in this thing together and that we have to depend on each other to make sure we do it right. I will say this as a way to end at least my introduction. One of the things that I believe and, uh, and your center is really focused on this is that we're not gonna get to a point of actually having what I believe to be uh, a way to combat systemic racism, systemic discrimination, institutional discrimination, 
unless we have a great education system that fosters it. We're not gonna get to that place where we need unless we put this into the threads of our system, into our curriculum, into all that we do. So I appreciate all on board here that are with that. We're not gonna do it until we get more teachers of color in place. We're not gonna do it until we get a system in place where all of us are valued as educators. So uh, Geneva, I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate the invitation and I look forward to it. Absolutely, thank you very much. And um, Dr. Jason Glass and welcome back you know, to the Commonwealth of Kentucky. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dr. Stark. Uh, I guess what I would first request is somebody else follow Aaron Thompson. I don't know that I can I can follow that, but I'll, I'll do my best. Thanks um, uh, for the opportunity to be here with this incredible panel and to be part of this uh, discussion and conversation. Um, I'm honored to be back in the state. I grew up in Kentucky, but have been away for about uh, two decades. So there's been a lot to learn, but there's a tremendous amount of uh, positive energy around education in Kentucky right now. It's, it's going to be an exciting time the next couple of years in education. I'm excited about where we can go. And, and also uh, building on what the Lieutenant Governor said, I think we've got the uh, right people in place to have a, an incredible future visioning uh, around education in Kentucky. I think there are um, three incredible pressures uh, or accelerations happening uh, that have been happening for some time, but they really beg us to reconsider uh, and think about how school has to change, how the experience of education has to change. One of those is the interconnectedness of the global economy, and that's just getting faster and faster and faster. Uh, and that's going to have an impact on the kinds of jobs that we have in Kentucky now and in the future, and that our students, when they graduate, are going to have to compete for. Um, a second, uh, is the uh, ever increasing instant access to content, information, and processing power. Uh, it's going to just get faster. The devices that we have already can bring the whole world to your fingertips, and that, that's only going to become more ubiquitous as time moves forward. Um, and the third is the increasing pressures of automation. Anything that can be done by a machine is going to get replaced by a machine. And so when we think about the largest employment sectors or things like retail, um, and we already have the technology where you can walk in stores, pull the things you want off the shelf, and walk out, or it just comes to your door uh, automatically um, through drones or whatever uh, the next delivery system that may come, that's going to change uh, and disrupt employment sectors like retail, like transportation in ways that we can't really even imagine. So if we're not preparing our kids for that kind of future, uh, we're not really preparing our kids for, for uh, what for what's to come and really what's what's already here. So I'm excited about that conversation. I'll end by saying the only kind of transformation in education that matters. And transformation is an overused word when it comes to transformation. We've talked a lot about transformation and not things are not very different really. The only kind of transformation that matters is did you transform what the student experienced? Is the student's experience different and different in a way that genuinely prepares them for that future that they have ahead? Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Dr. Glass. Um, truly appreciate those words. Um, um, my president, um, Dr. Neely Bendapudi at the University of Louisville. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, to echo what everyone else has said, Dr. Stark, I'm thrilled that you put this panel together and I'm very, very honored to be on this. And uh, Lieutenant Governor Coleman, and uh, you've heard my friend and mentor and uh, leader of higher education, Aaron Thompson, and Dr. Glass, thank you for your comments. I'll, I'll uh, probably pick up on comments that all of them have said because I was just sitting back listening because everyone made great, uh, great points about the future of education and the innovation, the transformation that's desperately needed. I always think that each of us is fighting to improve the world. I do believe that. Every single one of us is saying, how do we leverage the transformative power of education to better individuals' lives, their families, and their communities. So for me, I'll speak a little bit from the University of Louisville perspective. A couple of things that I want people to know is that when we think of transformation, the University of Louisville is one of only 130 or so universities across the world that are now classified as R1 or Carnegie's uh, classification of very, very high research. And I think many of you know that, so I'm aware that part of our responsibility is the research we're doing to make sure that we use best practices to improve higher education. 
The thing that many of you may not be aware of though, is that the Education Trust recently did a study of the top 100 and 101 public universities. And they looked at what percentage of them have actually more than 10% black students. And this may shock you or maybe not shock you. It certainly did me that of the top 101 public universities, highly selective universities in this country, only two had populations more than 10% of black students. We are happy to be one of them, but I think that's not a distinction that I'm terribly proud of. It just shows we are the best of a bad lot. There's so much more to be done. We're also proud that we have one of only three universities that has a grade of A in terms of serving both Black and Latino, Latina students. But what does it mean to serve them? How do we transform higher education? If I had my druthers, we wouldn't have majors anymore. When students came in, we would ask them, what problems do you want to tackle? Because it's increasingly about putting together those portfolios of skills. So in our school, in our university, we're trying to think about three grand challenges that I would like, it's back to Dr. Glass's point actually, about having every student think about how are you going to empower your communities? That's one big grand challenge we have to face. How are you going to advance health? And by health, we mean physical, mental, spiritual, financial, all ideas of health and well-being. And then how will you help us engineer the future? So whether you're a poet or a philosopher, one little thing we're going to do is every graduate of the University of Louisville in four years time will have at least some micro-credentials in digital technologies. It doesn't matter what you study, you have to be prepared for that. So I'll end with this. When I think about higher education, it's, a, it's something I speak from my personal experience. How do we look at helping students achieve the good life, however they may define it? How will they make a good living? But above all, how will they be good citizens that help to improve the world, not just for themselves, but we talk about the cardinal community of care. We care about ourselves, we care about one another, and we care about the community within which we are embedded. And so, like in our School of Education, we realize that it's not just higher education. We must start from the time a child is born so that they have the opportunity to fully realize their potential, notwithstanding the zip code that they're born into or the color of their skin. So that's something that we are um, excited uh, to pursue as part of our anti-racist agenda. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Hey, thank you, Dr. Bindapudi. I um, truly appreciate it. And um, my former boss, um, Dr. Marty Polio, um, superintendent of Jefferson County Public Schools. Great. Thank you, Dr. Stark, for having me. Good to see you again. It's always good to see you. And I do want to say, got my uh, EDD, my doctorate from the University of Louisville in 2012, and probably uh, the most meaningful experience educationally for me came in those three years at the University of Louisville. Um, getting my doctorate. So very excited to be here with you today and talking about um, something that I'm very passionate about, which is transforming education. And I think it is more imperative than ever that we do this. And so as we are in this pandemic right now, I do believe this and I've challenged our leaders. I see some of our leaders on this call right now, but in any crisis becomes opportunity. So we have opportunity here. And so we've talked about change in education for decades. We've talked about it. Um, but really what we've done is tinkered around the edges. And if we really think about it, if we really look to what we are doing right now in education across this nation and probably across the world, but we'll just focus on this nation. You know, I graduated from uh, high school in 1989. So I was a product of an education of the, of the 80s. And so if we think back to that, how much has truly changed in education? Yeah, the technology is different. Um, kids may be using different types of technology. The film strip isn't there anymore. That was when I was in school, the VCR, things like that. But really the experience of the children is not the same as Dr. Glass was talking about what type of experience are kids having? And if we really dig into the experience of what happened in 1980s and 70s and 60s, and now is really not that different. What? And so here is, um, you know, we are, we are expecting to have different results 
without making major changes. And the resistors to change in education are extremely strong and it's very difficult. And so we are passionate here in JCPS, as most people are in this call, about eliminating the achievement gap and tackling the tough things. And I want to, a surreal experience I had a couple of years ago, we're a part of an organization called the Council of the Great City Schools, top 76 school districts in America by enrollment. JCPS is about 29th in that uh, ranking. And I'm on a committee, a task force for achievement. Um, for black boys and black girls. It became about both. It started um, for black males, but it moved into females as well. And I was sitting there with 76 superintendents across America in the largest school districts. And for about four hours, we talked about the problem. But we realized after four hours, no one had any solution to the problem of how we could significantly tackle the achievement gap in this country. And I walked away from there thinking it's because we're thinking in the same paradigm, the same experience that kids have, the same curriculum, um, the same way we grade students, the same expectation of the amount of minutes that somebody should be sitting in a seat in a classroom. Um, and we could go through all of these things. So I've become very passionate that if we expect different results, we must do things very differently. Um, my passion in uh, change when I was at the University of Louisville became around grading. And that's a perfect example. I believe the way we grade students is one of the most inequitable things that we do um, that impacts students with the achievement gap. But when you try to make change around grading practices, it's one of the most difficult things to do because of the resistance to change. And so this is our opportunity with the pandemic that we are facing right now, as we begin to build back, we must have these critical conversations. If we expect outcomes to change, we must do everything differently than we've done before. Not just a few things, not small changes, but massive changes to our education system. We have to look back 30 years and say, well, we really changed the way we do things if we expect different results. If not, 30 years from now, we will be tackling the same problems and asking the same questions and wondering why we haven't gotten different results with our students. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Dr. Polio and Dr. Chris Williams, um, who's the Chancellor of the Kentucky um, Community College System. Welcome, thank you for being thank here. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here today with all these partners, you know, these are folks, it's just a real pleasure to be here with them on the air, the Lieutenant Governor, President Bendapudi, President Thompson, Commissioner Glass and the rest, but also to know that we, we and our staffs work together all the time to try to really have that P20 system to meet the needs of anyone in the Commonwealth who is in school, preparing for work, already working to help all of us move forward as, as people are successful and you know successful as employees, successful as citizens, successful as entrepreneurs. Uh, we, um, I, I, it's just a real privilege to be here today to represent our 16 colleges spread out across the Commonwealth. Uh, we have a location within about 30 minutes of everybody to drive to, but certainly we also have a very robust online presence and online presence and simulation presence that's been put to the test over these last few months. So we're really focused on how do we stay very relevant, keep our programs very relevant, and be sure that we're working with our employers, our school partners as the largest providers of dual credit offerings and the largest workforce development providers in the Commonwealth. We know that higher ed matters. We're right there with the Council on Post-Secondary Education. We know that each student who comes and gets a short-term certificate or a diploma or degree has the capability and capacity to earn more money over their lifetime. We really love partnering with the University of Louisville and are very excited about a new, two new uh, partnerships, one on apprenticeships and one on cybersecurity. We, we just are very, we're very strongly focused on ensuring that anybody can walk up to our doors and find a place in our institution and find a way to move themselves forward with our higher education. 
And so again, it's a real pleasure to be here today to learn from the other panelists, but also to share some of the things that we're doing to accelerate our student success and close those achievement gaps. So Dr. Stark, thank you for inviting me and I look forward to the conversation. Absolutely, hey, thank you for being here this morning. And at the end of our presentation this morning, we're going to have a brief demonstration of virtual reality, a, um, something that's innovative. And we have um, Chris Masden that's going to introduce himself and then Shannon Putnam. Great, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Um, so I have about 20 years of experience in behavioral science and it was back in 2013 that I had my first social VR experience, putting on a headset, stepping into a virtual environment, having the developer of that platform step towards me and suddenly find myself stepping two steps back because suddenly personal space bubbles matter in a virtual environment in which you feel entirely present. So uh, I uh, pulled off the headset and told my wife that night that I was making a serious shift in my career and uh, jumped both feet fully into virtual reality. Um, I work for a company called Immersive VR Education and we specialize in creating educational content, communication and collaboration, multi-user in virtual reality where everything is possible. And not only can we be in any experience, but we can share those experiences together. A teacher to an entire classroom full of kids where you can move beyond passive learning experiences and move to experiential learning. I had a few years working for an avatar company because when you're in a, a virtual reality, you have to have a body in order to interact with each other. So I spent a couple of years uh, developing a, a patent with a fantastic team of how to carry your identity uh, from one virtual location to another and maintain who we are when we're in those virtual environments uh, and enabling that ability to reach out and shake your students' hands and interact within that environment as though it was real. You know, your brain interprets it as real. So the possibilities are endless. And uh, I'll tell you, COVID has accelerated everything uh, far beyond my expectations. And all of us in this field are scrambling to make this a seamless, friction-free experience as the need uh, uh, continues to grow. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, truly appreciate it. And we have. Um, Shannon Putnam, who is a, she's going to introduce herself. Yes, uh, hello and thank you everybody. I feel honored just to be in the room with everybody. Um, I am a graduate research assistant and PhD student here at U of L. I was a 13 year JCPS employee, proud member at 500 West Galbert, Bill Cochran Elementary. And uh, I've been using VR for about six, seven years. And what's exciting about this is to showcase um, what U of L and JCPS are doing. And when I say that they're really taking this and running it, and everybody's been talking about how we actually need to make a change and not just talk about a change, um, they're actually doing it because some of the technology that you're going to see today is bleeding edge. And the way that we are implementing this technology at U of L and JCPS, people are not doing it yet. We are some of the first people in the country and even internationally to be doing it to the level that we are doing it. So we're excited to share it with everybody and hopefully uh, we'll get to see some people in virtual reality as well. So thank you for allowing me to be here. Okay. Hey, um, um, thank you all for being here. And uh, we're gonna just dive into the questions. And um, this is the, the one question for everyone. What is the one thing our community can expect from you in your leadership role? What is the one thing that uh, our community can expect? And again, they are listening from all across the Commonwealth of Kentucky. So we're gonna start with um, Lieutenant Governor Coleman. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, I, I think, that it would be fair for me to say that the one thing um, that can be expected from me as, as Lieutenant Governor working with Governor Bashir, but also as Secretary of Education and Workforce Development is it's to listen. Uh, it's something that I'm committed to do. We have lots to learn. We have lots to accomplish. We have a long way to go and uh, we can't do that individually. And so before we can begin to take steps forward, we certainly have to sit down and uh, do our fair share of listening uh, as we try to craft uh, the way forward and the best opportunities for our kids. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Bendapudi, what is the one thing that the Cardinal land can um, expect from you? Uh, I think to be collaborative. 
because these problems are too big for any one individual or even any one organization to tackle. Mm -hmm. So I think that hopefully in the almost two and a half years I've been here, that's what they've seen. But beyond our own university, uh, for any of the people that are on the panel today or otherwise, I hope they will say, we can count on UFL and me personally to be very collaborative because we are all dedicated to the same life. Thank you very much. Dr. Thompson. You know, our North Star is 60% uh, educational attainment by 2030. And what you can count on me to do is to work toward that North, North Star strategically, making sure we don't leave anybody behind. We're going to have to have everybody. We can't leave people of color, low income people, adult learners. We can't leave them behind. And we're going to have to do this in a very strategic way. And I just talk about it. So you can count on me working with our P20. Uh, counterparts and our workforce industry and business leaders to make that happen. It has to be a lifelong learning into the workplace where we have top quality that no one's left behind. Uh, I will not just talk about it. I'll do everything I can to make sure it's a part of our career. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Polio. Yeah, thank you. And I'll, let's, um, you know, I'll echo, obviously, what everyone said, but try to go a little bit different direction. First of all, without a doubt, they can always expect passion from me, um, passion for the kids of this community and passion uh, for improving outcomes for kids. I also want to say, without a doubt, and this is something I've learned in my first couple years doing this, um, people can expect to hear the truth and transparency from me. And although that may be difficult, um, and it's and difficult sometimes to talk about your own organization and things that need to change, um, but they can expect to hear that from me because I think in today's time, we need to spotlight and highlight our challenges, be honest and transparent, and then be open to collaboration about solutions. But there is without a doubt, they're gonna hear that from me as long as I'm in this position. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Glass. Thank you. I, I think what folks can expect from me is positive change. I, reflect on my um, career and in leadership roles. I've been effective at getting places unstuck and getting places moving um, toward, uh, toward a better place. I, I really think that every leader is temporary and that includes all of us on this call. Our tenures may be longer or shorter, but there's a fuse burning on all of us and we have, a, we have an obligation to get as much positive uh, work done in the time that we have uh, with the time that we have. So uh, that's what you can count on me for is positive change. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Williams. Thank you. I've already mentioned the power of our current collaborations. So let me add perhaps this focus on the future of work. Our students who have work-based learning experiences while they're in college are, are better prepared to go to work. They're better prepared to transfer for universities in a career. And so those employer partnerships, partnerships with employer-based organizations, the Workforce Investment, excuse me, Workforce Innovation Boards, the uh, Kentucky Workforce Innovation Board, our partner institutions like the Kentucky Chamber and the Association, um, CAM, the Kentucky Association of Manufacturing, these partnerships help improve the outcomes for our students. And so they're one of our primary focus areas. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Glass, um, there was a um, something called the MERS Scholarship, Minority Educated Recruitment and Retention Program um, that was in place for a number of years to increase the number of students of color in education. Um, and that program was uh, abolished a couple of years ago. What is the plan for the future and um, with attracting or increasing the number of teachers of color in our education system and Dr. Glass. Thank you. Well, that scholarship was a, a program under a larger umbrella of programs uh, called the Kentucky Academy for uh, Equity and Teaching, mm -hmm. uh, which included a number of different initiatives that were aimed at increasing the number of um, minorities in the educator workforce and, and improving the diversity of the workforce. So. Um, 
regrettably, uh, funding has not come, uh, has not followed that effort. One of the major initiatives that uh, will be moving forward in this next legislative session is to raise up that whole um, umbrella of programs again, the Kentucky uh, Academy for Equity and Teaching. Um, and ask for it to be adequately funded uh, where it has a chance at being successful. Um, I don't think that uh, if, if we look back over the past uh, few years, it was the right effort uh, a few years ago. It's certainly the right effort now. Uh, it's a good structure that was put in place before I got here, but I, I think it's time for us to really consider, uh, can we resource it in a way that it can be effective? Thank you very much. Um, um, Lieutenant Governor Coleman, um, can you respond to that question? Now? What can you do in your role in, as Lieutenant Governor to increase the number of teachers of color in the Commonwealth of Kentucky? I sure can, thank you. Uh, and this is one of our top priorities. Uh, as um, Commissioner Glass just mentioned, uh, the Kentucky Academy for Equity and Teaching uh, exists, but it's gone um, un unfunded or underfunded for far too long. Uh, and so as Secretary of Education and Workforce Development, I am committed to making an investment uh, in that program to get it back on its feet and then um, requesting that the legislature content continue uh, to fund it the way it was supposed to be funded. Um, but I think this is a really important program that if we if we mean what we say, we need to literally be willing to put our money where our mouth is, and and that is a commitment that that I'm prepared to make on behalf of Governor Bashir and myself. We're also very um, interested in how we can collaborate with our universities, with our HBCUs, uh, to make sure that um, we re we recruit and are able to retain. Uh, the best and brightest. It is so important that our kids uh, see for the first, in my opinion, the first leader that they see outside of their home is so often their teacher. And so uh, our kids deserve, deserve to see themselves in those leadership roles from an early age. And we know the data just uh, speaks for itself, but the, the transformational change that that creates in an entire generation of kids is something we cannot ignore. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Polio, can you um, speak to the new program that um, the partnership with JC, with U of L um, regarding the Louisville Teacher Residency Program? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Stark. And first of all, let me say this. I mean, we have a crisis on our hands when it comes to um, uh, teachers of color across this nation, but we also have a crisis on our hand when it comes to a teacher shortage period that I think is only gonna be magnified in the next decade to a crisis point if we don't take action nationally, tough decisions are gonna to have to be made um, across this country. And so, you know, I think we need to have very serious discussions about why that is. Why are the amount of students in uh, teacher certification programs declining significantly? I go to scholarship programs now where our best and brightest in JCPS get awarded scholarships. 20 to 30 kids and they all talk about what they're doing and where they're going next. And it's hard, very rare, if ever, I hear anyone say that they're getting into the teaching profession. And that's heartbreaking. Um, and I understand it as a father, like most fathers who thinks he has the smartest and most talented daughter on the planet. Um, I often think that um, I wonder what she says I'm going into teaching. Would I encourage that? Or would I discourage that? So I think we've got to start from that point right there and say, why in this country is that the case when it comes to the teaching profession? But we also, when, when um, JCPS passed our racial equity plan about 18 months ago, um, we said that right now to have 14% black teachers and 36% black students is unacceptable. And the research has become very clear in recent years. It's, it's nearly settled when students have black teachers um, and, or teachers that look like them, and this should be for all students, my daughter included, black or white students, that the number of students that graduate and go to college uh, dramatically increases. And so we've got, we said in JCPS, we've just got to stop, stop hoping that we get more students who come out of post-secondary programs into uh, JCPS. And, and really we were doing a lot of that hoping and going out and recruiting a lot, no doubt about it, but we've got to work on our own. So um, we partnered with the University of Louisville and started a teacher residency program. And so lots of people in our district, and I'm gonna say this, 
Um, in my time as a principal and a superintendent, there have been so many of former students who have graduated from college come back and say, you know, I really want to be a teacher. I say, what'd you get your degree in? And they got it in something else. Can, is there anything I can do? Well, you're going to have to go back to school and get your teacher certification program. Well, now with the teacher residency program, we have a great opportunity for young people and veterans, second career, to say, I want to get into to teaching, get my certification, but I don't have to go back to school and do that full time and not have a job. So we employ them in our teacher residency program. They go into a high need school. Monday through Thursday, they'll be with a master teacher um, and be in that classroom. So in high needs classrooms, we'll have multiple adult, adults in there. They'll be learning from a master teacher Monday through Thursday. They'll be taking class on Friday at the University of Louisville. And within one year, they'll get a master's degree and a teacher certification. And so right now, um, you know, we have about 25 out of the 30 candidates in the teacher residency program are black teachers or teachers of color. So we're very proud of that. But I think we need to do 100 a year in order to mitigate a teacher shortage, number one, and teachers of color, number two. So these are the type of programs that we're going to have to start thinking outside of the box across this nation if we expect to mitigate the problems that I just outlined. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Polio. Um, another question, equity and access have been magnified during the pandemic. How might you provide leadership in addressing these matters? And when I say that is that there was an article that was written this past summer and it outlined that Kentucky was ranked as the 10 worst state you know, in the country in terms of access to students, where we have 36% of our students without adequate connection, another 27% without devices. You know, how are we addressing that um, across the Commonwealth? Because we do have individuals that live in rural areas. We do have individuals that live in urban areas that do not have hotspots or, or access to the internet. So I'm going to pose that question to um, um, Dr. Coleman and Dr. Glass. Um, what are we doing to address those issues? So um, I, I can speak to that. Uh, when, when we talk about COVID so often, one thing that I point out is that um, it has created its own new set of challenges, certainly, but it has magnified old ones that have been hiding in plain sight. And uh, anyone who works in education or who has a kid in the education system can tell you uh, the ways in which there, we, we lack equity. Uh, we've reached a point now when it comes to technology, um, it's, not, it's not a privilege, it's not an option anymore, it's required. Uh, we are in a, a, a society that continues to become more and more dependent upon it for communication and collaboration and, and academics. Uh, and so we have committed uh, to a short-term and a long-term uh, solution. The short-term solution is uh, deploying hotspots um, and getting those out to every part of Kentucky uh, as quickly as we can. It doesn't matter, again, if it's urban or rural, uh, this is a challenge for every Kentucky family. And so we want to um, point out that we started with about 10% of students in Kentucky that lacked uh, a, a stable uh, connection, connectivity. Uh, and we, thanks to the work of the Department of Education and lots of agencies across Kentucky, have actually gotten that number down to 3%. Now, we're still talking about 20,000 students. And so that's not a small number, but uh, we're working towards that in the short term. In the long term, we are currently working with both public and private partners to uh, complete that last mile broadband and to make sure that uh, the, the people in, in the most remote areas of Kentucky have access uh, to this connectivity because as you all know, we've changed the way that we learn. We change the way that we work and we can't afford to leave anybody behind on that. Absolutely, thank you very much. Dr. Glass. Well, thank you. And I uh, echo what uh, Lieutenant Governor Coleman said. I think we're down to a very small number of students that we're not, that we don't have, uh, who don't have internet access and don't have a device. I'm not sure what um, the source was for the statistics that you were citing earlier, uh, but that 
I think I think in Kentucky we we've, we've done a good job trying to reach students. Now that's not to say that the last group of students that we're trying to reach isn't expensive and difficult to get to. Uh, that last step uh, is the most expensive group of students to reach uh, in, in terms of cost and in terms of infrastructure uh, to get to that point. But Kentucky also has uh, decades of investing in infrastructure and education technology, and so that's a, a capacity that we built upon going into this pandemic. Um, with that said, we, we have plenty of challenges when it comes to students who are working um, remotely or under NTI. Uh, most of the districts in the state are offering some kind of in-person uh, instruction, but we have two large districts that are not. And uh, increasingly around the state, we should expect districts to get pitched back in, pitched back into NTI experiences as the number of cases in the community uh, continues to grow. Uh, they have to quarantine students or staff members. We're not seeing transmissions in schools, but the mere presence of the virus in, in our communities around the state leads to disruption uh, in schools and we have to send kids and teachers home for two weeks uh, periods of time uh, for, for these quarantines. So it creates a lot of disruption. Uh, all of these experiences exacerbate the inequities that were already present before. Um, and so all the more energy is going to have to be uh, put into identifying students that are struggling or behind uh, and then intervening and providing supports for them going forward. That's going to be made all the more difficult because at the same time that pressures and needs on for our students and on our education systems is going to be at arguably an all-time high. We're going to simultaneously uh, face a, a potential funding crisis in the current budget year and going forward. And so that's going to be a tremendous challenge that we're going to have to navigate. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Aaron Thompson, um, as we talk about um, racism, social justice, and also curriculum, you know, um, what are we, what are some of the things that we can do in higher education to address um, curriculum and, and what it looks like right now and what it should look like moving forward? Thank you for that question. If you don't mind, I want to go back and answer another question too, and I'll do it quickly. Uh, since uh, my office is in charge of post-secondary programs like teacher ed programs, I think it's important for us to say that we have research on your questions on how we get more people of color in teaching. Uh, there's several, and I'll make it quick because there's a lot to this. The, first of all, we need to use a weed in program versus a weed out program. I mean, we have enough information shows that the way we uh, weed people out, that has a huge effect on people of color when it comes to teacher prep programs. We, haven't, we can use our dual credit. We can use a variety of ways to put people into a pipeline. We can change, and this is going to your question now, we have to change the way that we've got the curriculum set up in our teacher prep programs because they don't look a lot different than they did before. Even though we have CAPE accreditation, how are we judging what we're doing around uh, cultural competence and cultural responsiveness versus the way we've done it before? How are we using assessment? We've got to start a way of building a clinical experience in the first year to where students know the value of teaching because they've been told over and over again, there's more money they can make in other places, there's no value to teaching. We've got to be clear and explicit, transparent, even in the money, the time they have, and a variety of other things that we know works. The other thing too is we've got to have districts like uh, JCPS that's willing to hire students early, that's identifying them and getting them. And then for the three years that they hire them, giving them some leadership opportunities and professional development opportunities to get where they need to go. And there's a lot more to that, but we know what works and how it works. We can use MERG, all of those things are added items. They're icing on the cake, but it's not the cake. We've got to systematically change the way that we're doing business, both with EPSB and with the CPE and with all of us, with uh, uh, all that we're doing and how we're doing. Okay, that's quickly, even though there's a lot more to that. The thing that I can tell you what we have to do though, if we still have the same curriculum in our educational system offered and done the same way 10 years ago, we're way behind times. We are gonna to have to figure out exactly how that we move from a teaching paradigm to a learner's paradigm and a learner's paradigm that's gonna to have to deal with uh, new immigrants, that's gonna to have to deal with people of color that they've left behind, gonna to have to deal with adult learners, andragogy versus pedagogy. It's gonna to have to do a variety of things. If you wanna get rid of systematic racism, 
put systems in place to do that, like the curriculum has to change at all levels. Faculty development has to change at all levels. Tenure and promotion system has to change at all levels to promote these as a value system proposition, but also as a diversity equity proposition. You learn more from people different from you than people like you. Have we incorporated that in our co-curriculum? Have we incorporated that in our curriculum? Have we incorporated that in hiring faculty and staff uh, with that in mind as an entry level proposition to how we hire? So what I, and there's a whole lot more to that, Geneva, I'll stop there. But the point being is that if racism still exists in our educational system where it shouldn't exist, then we've got to really do a SWOT analysis and find out why we already know the answers, but we've got to then strategically work to combat those. And that is the, and that is the question, what is the action plan? You know, because for many of us, we've been on many committees previously, you know, and the goal is what is going to be the action plan? How do we move forward? Because it's, we have the answers, but how do we put those systems in place to come up with an action plan to move forward? And I wanna add this, CPE, we've done two things. We've created a comprehensive diversity policy that all of our institutions have to buy into, not just in the numbers, but how they're building a culturally competent campus at all, all levels. How are they building a whole student? That's number one. We put in our performance funding model, a, uh, a diversity equity set of metrics that goes to say, that this is a priority we have in the state. Now, I want to just give you some quick numbers about putting it in place. For an example, in the last few years that I've been in this job, overall undergraduate enrollment's down 3%, but we're up 12% in undergraduate enrollment of URN. We're up twice that amount this fall. Uh, that's the only category that's up in the state. The other thing too, we have a 17.5 percentage uh, I mean, percent increase in overall credentials and under and, and of all kinds from uh, uh, certificates to baccalaureate degrees. We're up 37% with our URN. It depends on what you focus on. It depends on how you focus on it. And it depends on whether or not you're willing to put your money where your mouth is. I mean, in the past, we've talked a lot about it. So your point about how we do this We've got evidence of how to do it. We just got to put it on steroids if we want to get more up. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. And um, and in speaking about that, um, Dr. Benapudi, um, you just <clears throat> mentioned that the University of Louisville is one to be one of the premier anti-racist universities. Speak to that. Um, um, what's um, what's the goal and and the why and the how you putting those systems in place? Glad to. Uh, when we talk about anti-racist university. To me, every university ought to be anti-racist because racism is simply, uh, it's many things, obviously we all know. And, uh, but at its core to me, as an educator, racism at its core is intellectual laziness. It's saying that I will know one trivial fact about you, the color of your skin, a social construct, and I will make all kinds of generalizations uh, about that and extrapolate beyond that. So anti-racism, so if racism is the simple idea that there's inherent superiority or inferiority conferred to you by the color of your skin, anti-racism is a very simple proposition that it does not. And so what we are trying to do at the university is to say, by the way, I don't ask myself, is there racism in our system? Because we know there is, it's, it, it, it's in every social system. So how do we now work together to see how we ameliorate its effects. How do we make sure that we make progress beyond that? So I asked, a, and at UFL I can brag because I had nothing to do with this, but for over 20 years, we've had a commission on diversity and racial equality called CODRA and a commission on the status of women called COSWA. So I asked CODRA to come up with specific areas that we ought to be paying attention to. And of course, a commission, you've been on many commissions, we can provide great reports and nobody looks at it again till five years later when you have to provide a report. I don't believe in that. So what I have asked them to do is work side by side. Uh, they've identified four broad areas. What will we do about faculty, staff, 
student and administrator. So four broad areas. There's a fifth one, which is a subset of students called trainees, specifically for residents and on the health sciences campus. But if you would bear with me and say it's these four broad areas that we really need to take a good hard look and make progress. I, we have now um, assigned a, an administrator to each of those groups. And Dr. Faye Jones, who is our chief diversity officer, reports directly to me. She has someone from her office uh, working with each of these groups. So together, what we hope to do, some of them are low hanging fruit. I think you know them, I know them. But to create them to be really meaningful, uh, where they're going to come up with a timeline and metric. And um, they've asked for a little bit of time. So early in 2021, given everything that's going on, we will be putting out those metrics and say, we will be measuring ourselves on it. We'll be transparent about it. And we will, um, we will hold ourselves accountable. I'd like to say two other things about this anti-racism agenda. People have asked me, does everybody support it? Have you gotten pushback uh, from legislators? Not at all, because to me, I really believe that we're all better off if every segment of our society has an opportunity to succeed and to thrive. I believe in that wholeheartedly. I'm also trying to model it from my level. So um, I won't make it too personal, but many of you know, for example, in the ACC, uh, I'm well aware as the only woman and person of color as a president or at the university, I know there are expectations of me. So everything from my senior leadership team, am I gathering a team that really brings diversity of thought? I want to add to um, what Dr. Thompson said. And if we have a minute, I'd like to talk about uh, digital divide, which I think is incredibly important and we need to address. So I think the people who benefit from having diversity of faculty in a classroom, and Dr. Polio alluded to it. It is not just the young person of color who desperately needs to see somebody who looks like them to dream that they could do that too, but it's important for our rural uh, populations, for our uh, majority populations to know that they are being uh, educated from many diverse perspectives because employers are looking for that. If you look at business, it's usually ahead of education, unfortunately. We talk a good game, but business sometimes is ahead of this. So that's something that's very important for us to cultivate. And if we have a moment, I won't go there now, Dr. Stark, but I'd love to talk about how in our School of Engineering, how our engineering dean is using such phenomenal ideas to rethink who we bring in rather than weed out. So. Anyway, and, all right, I cannot resist. Everybody, <laughs> this digital divide, one year ago today, go look at the top cities that were threatened by automation and why we are focusing on the Center for Digital Transformation here. It's November 19, if I recall. It's on, it was in all the papers. Louisville is one of the top 10 metro areas in the country, a threat for automation, doing away with good paying jobs. So COVID has just accelerated that, but this is important for us to address. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ben Napudi. Um, Dr. Chris Williams, can you speak about um, what's happening in, um, in the community college systems that regarding race and professional development, what, what is your role? What is your leadership? What are you doing to combat some of that? What is your conversation to your, your constituents? Thank you for that opportunity. We take, um, we take the opportunity for every individual who comes to us very seriously. If you come to a KCTCS college without a high school diploma, we can help you through adult education and you can take a credit certificate program at the same time. But part of it is helping people understand that that opportunity is available to them. Sometimes I feel like we're the best kept secret here that if you come to us, uh, we have a space for you. You don't have to have a certain grade point to start with us. You can walk in the door and we will find a way to help you move forward. And so um, I, I think one of our um, opportunities is to talk more about the value that we bring. You know, we have 115 
program areas of study. Five of those are transfer degrees that take you right on up to a four-year university. So you have a very affordable start. You can be successful in your third year, wh whoever you are, however you got to KCTCS. And then we have you know, 110, um, 110 technical programs, 68 uh, of which are in the Work Ready Kentucky Scholarship uh, availability. So anyone can come in and have the tuition covered for those programs of study. And you know, we know that when you graduate from them, you'll make more money and you'll have more opportunities. So uh, part of it for me, I think, is uh, alludes back to, to two things that Dr. Um, Dr. Thompson has said. One is each of our 16 colleges does have a diversity plan. Each one is in a different region with a different percentages of, of various populations. Some have a lot of people who are English as a second language, for example. Some might um, be almost majority minority. Others may have very small minority populations. So each one has a plan to increase the diversity in their students, their faculty, and their staff, and their administrators on their, on their campus based on uh, their community and how they can move forward. But the, the piece that I think we need to think about in terms of students is that the Council on Post-Secondary Education recently did a report looking at dual credit and how participation in dual credit opportunities can really then uh, speak to the student's ability to succeed in the higher education environment past high school, whether that's a KCTCS college or one of our public universities. And those students, particularly those students of color that were successful in a dual credit class were retained and were so much more successful. I think a lot of it sometimes is just getting the vision of yourself as a college student, you know, yes, I can do this. Yes, I can take part. And so we have a, a strong ad hoc committee that works between our KCTCS colleges and our KDE partners um, that really work on every possible facet of dual credit. And one of the things that they are really working hard on is how do we change the expectation for students of color in our, in our K-12 schools, in our high schools, that they can take dual credit. Too few of them participate, too few enroll. Is that um, because they don't see themselves as successful? Is it because uh, the counselor is not seeing them in the same light they might see some other student? We don't, we don't know that and we're not making assumptions. We just know that if we can all be on the same path, on the same language that these students need to move into the dual credit environment, then we feel like we can create a pathway into higher education that, that takes the student from early on. And with the Kentucky scholarships available, the dual credit scholarship, which covers two classes at a university or at KCTCS in the general education or technical classes, but also the work ready dual credit scholarships, which allow students who are ready for some technical education program in ninth grade even can take up to two classes a year, eight college credits, over 30 credits, almost half of an associate's degree while they're in high school. So we see that as a really wonderful pathway to bring people along and bring them into the, the academic realm in a way that perhaps they didn't perceive originally. So our big focus is, is really threefold, I guess. One is bringing students along through dual credit, but also inviting back adult students who may need to be reskilled or retrained for employment. Uh, you know, there's, there's lots of opportunities. You can look at uh, for the adults, for example, if you were interested in being a lineman, um, we have students who do that right after high school or coming back to the workforce can make an extraordinary salary after a very short program. Climbing poles is not for everyone. Working with electricity is not for everyone, but it may be a career somebody hasn't thought about. To our Kentucky Fame program, which is a two-year degree program, it's in partnership with employers. Those employers actually select the students in the program. The students work 24 hours a week. They uh, go to school full-time two days a week. They graduate with a two-year degree that can transfer on to university with some other courses taken um, after those two years. They've had their tuition covered through scholarships and through employer donations. They make somewhere between $12 and $19 an hour, depending on the uh, where they're working and the region that they're working in. 
they graduate and make $45,000 more a year on average, and they're retained and graduated at 80% rate because of that constant engagement and mentoring between employer, student, and college. Absolutely. So, and, and that's yeah. and the question with that is that how do we educate the community that the opportunities at KCTCS, you know, those opportunities, because many times the community just think that it has to be a four year degree and not looking at all the, the opportunities that's afforded. So what else can we do to educate the community of the opportunities available, you know, in the community college system? Well, we, we do a lot, you know, we, we try very hard to market. We have a lot of folks, recruiters and our faculty out in the community. We hope that our graduates are being ambassadors, although many do go on and, you know, end up speaking to their four-year experience, perhaps more than their two-year experience. I, I really appreciate that Lieutenant Coleman, uh, Lieutenant Governor Coleman and uh, President Thompson have uh, really focused on sort of that, you know, cradle to career a full pathway so that um, they are talking about and their staff are talking about all of the opportunities and all of the ways to move forward. I mean, KCTCS is an extraordinary way to have an affordable higher education. Our two years at our institutions, graduating with your associate degree, it transfers right on to the university. We have a lot of very strong transfer agreements. So it's not like you're gonna lose credits unless you've just taken some pretty weird credit pathways you know, on your, on your own. And you've paid a lot less. And then we know through research that in your third year at that university, you're probably going to be more successful than that institution's own students. So I think we have to essentially, you know, create our own cadre of storytellers. It's hard to compete with all of the media marketing that's out there, you know. Um, Southern New Hampshire and uh, Phoenix and all of these institutions spend extraordinary numbers of dollars, dollars that we do not have for marketing. So our marketing is our story, our our one on one, our students in the high schools, our uh, representatives and workforce solutions folks in the companies doing incumbent worker training, all of these ways that we're reaching out. But I'll tell you, I'll, I'll sign you up. You are welcome to be an ambassador because we are very proud of what we offer and uh, feel like it's an opportunity for everyone. Hey, thank you very much. Um, at this time, we're going to have a, um, a brief demonstration of um, um, VR and virtual reality with Shannon Putnam and, um, and with Steve K. DeSato. And so just stay tuned to be able to experience this virtual reality experience. And as we're speaking about transforming education through innovation, what can we do differently? These, uh, this virtual reality is, is an opportunity for us to do something different. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Stark. Um, so we've been very fortunate to have some forward thinking people in U of L and JCPS and um, kind of saw the writing on the wall before COVID hit. And one thing that COVID did show us is that we have not been preparing our students for the digital world. How many students don't know how to log into their own email? They can't get into their Google classrooms. And these are things that we hadn't been focused on because we're focused on standards and other things. So when we talk about teaching and preparing students for the world they're going to live in, we have to do things differently. They don't know how to open up a tab. Those have to be things that are critical to their education. And one of the things that we're seeing that is happening is um, virtual reality. And a lot of people think it's this gimmick, but what's happening is in industry and employment, they're seeing the benefits and how it can be used. Uh, companies like UPS, Lowe's, um, they're all using virtual reality to train employees and to cut costs and to improve safety. And so uh, JCPS and UofL, um, has gotten on board with this. And that's been one of, um, that's been my focus. And I, it's been so lucky to have supportive people because we're already seeing the Zoom fatigue. It's already happened, it's happening and it's continuing. So we have to do something different. And one of the things I did just want to point out that um, I also wanted to give uh, credit to JCPS and UofL is yep. preparing um, for the uh, COVID situation. We have a technology called CleanFox which uses uh, medical grade UVC light to destroy virus. So all of the equipment that we have is um, CDC standard sanitary. And that's also gonna be something moving forward that we're gonna to have to consider. Um, so all these little things that we never had to think of before are coming into play. And so what you're gonna see is uh, Chris is actually in 
the program he mentioned, the software Engage. So he's in his headset and he's going to be kind of coming to you live from that. And I'm going to step out and go join him virtually for you guys. So Steve, if you're ready, I think you'll be sharing your screen now. All right, thank you, Shannon. So yes, let me share my screen so we can uh, get Chris in here. And he is also in Engage, so you all can hear him. Let me do a couple of things. There we go. All right. Great. Great. Can you all hear me, on the, all hear me on the Zoom side? Steven, anybody? Steven? Can, you, can you all hear me on, the, all hear me on, on the Zoom side of things? Yes. Yes, we can. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I understand I, I have I about 10 minutes, about so 10 I'm going to move as fast as I possibly can. can. First of all, first of welcome to the Engage platform. The platform. Uh, this allows, this us, to allows us to be up to 50 up. people together in a virtual environment. Thank you, Stephen, for muting my inside mic. Um, You're welcome. So I want to show you very quickly how I can bring in 3D objects, because that's what VR is all about, this ability to share in experiences. And we wanna make it as friction-free for educators to be rock stars, to bring in 3D environments, to use multimedia, and create these very compelling interactive experiences. And let me just show you how easy that is. All I do is go into my tablet here, and I can pull out very quickly, say, an elephant. And you can see that I just using my hand controllers, I can rotate that elephant around. Let me get right up to you there, Stephen. And uh, you know, it, it's really interesting when it comes to the brain of how we perceive experiences. When we have something away from us, we pay somewhat attention to it. But just like in the real world, when something becomes comes within our grasp, our brain kicks into this hyper-aware mode and we notice more details. And it takes it to maximum level when you can simply reach in and grab that object. In fact, when we implemented that ability, I actually asked our tech team if we did something new with our models because- I'm so sorry to interrupt. What's the password so I can join you? Oh, uh, it's 999, Shannon, come on in. <laughs> so uh, you can see that it's just so easy to interact. And I, you know, if Steven was in VR, he's actually joining us yeah. from a 2D screen. I could hand that to him. He could take that object. So you can see how you can tear apart engines and have these experiences together. Let me show you a quick example of how uh, uh, Colorado State University used some of these uh, 3D objects. Here we go. All right, so they run a veterinary uh, <laughs> school and uh, they wanted to bring in the ability to analyze a dog who had a lame leg. How do you identify that? How do you examine the x-rays and, and walk students through that? So here's what that looks like. Here we go. So here you can see we've got the dog and you can see that it's walking with some lameness there. And it's the student's job to figure out, you know, which leg is lame, what's going on here. And then you've got these x-rays as well that you can examine. And again, everything is completely shareable. So if I wanted to, uh, for example, uh, grab this bone, I could ha handle that. And Shannon, come on over. Yeah, Let me you can pass the bone. I'll show you how mm -hmm. that works collaboratively. There you go. And Shannon, I'm not a doctor. I don't know much about x-rays, but uh, this one, uh, you know, it looks like there's something going on there. <laughs> That's awesome. Cool. So because we're short on time, I'm going to go ahead and jump out of this environment because, you know, let's face it, if, if you're in VR, do you really want to be in a classroom environment when you can be on the surface of the moon or down at the, uh, on a seabed somewhere? But before we leave, I just want to show that we can bring your normal tools into the VR experience as well. For example, I can just reach up here and write on the board. Hi, class. That easy, right? You know, do your graphs, pull out your colored markers, you know, show your graphs. Uh, it's, it's all very easy. We're going to hop into the next space and I'll show you a little bit how the multimedia and all the other tools work. Bear with me. We're going to make that transfer now.
All right, come on down, everybody. So one thing we wanted to make sure of when we were developing educa an educational platform is we did not want to dismiss all of the millions of pieces of, of 2D content that exists out there. So we wanted to make it possible to access things like, you know, YouTube and Vimeo and share websites and even share our desktop screen for the class to see. So I can operate on my computer and everybody can see exactly what I'm doing. Um, in this case, uh, we have a web app that stores all of your video links and your web links and all of that. Uh, so let me find one that, by the way, we are in the pomp, a, a recreation of the Pompeii Amphitheater, which has been redone to show what it looks like um, back in the day. Here we go. So I'm going to pull up a video here of Pompeii reconstruction. Let me turn the volume down a little bit. Now, because we're in VR, we're not limited to any one screen. I mean, why be limited when anything is possible? So in, in that case, I can just, you know, go into my video screen category very easily and just start pulling out screens. Like here's a screen on a cart. Let me turn the volume a little bit here. Great. Uh, here's, a, here's another screen on a cart. We've got, uh, I can make little teeny screens that I can hand to people. Here, Shannon, do you want to take this one as like your little personal iPad? Let me share that with you. Okay, here you go. Or we could even make a screen that fills the entire sky. I mean, we can make this screen 100 feet tall if we want to. Anything is possible. So there's how the media works. Let me go ahead and delete some of these. And of course, you want a web browser when you're doing instructions as well. So let me show you what a web browser looks like. Here we go. I'm going to go back into my media. And I've actually got one stored here. Web links, here we go. How about this one? This is one you should recognize. There you go. It's that easy. I can scroll through the website. I can actually use my virtual tablet. You can't see it because it's invisible uh, to the observer, but I've got this tablet here that allows me to do everything uh, with the web browser that you would expect. So if I wanted to go take a look at the campuses, I just click the button and there we go through the website. So sharing media, very, very easy. All right, let's um, bring out a little something else. Uh, maybe you wanna capture an image off the web to decorate your class with. So let me show you how easy, it's really as easy as just getting a URL to that image, and then you can bring that in as a poster into the virtual environment and decorate as you wish. Let me show you what that looks like. So I'm gonna go in, pull down some URLs. And I think it's important to note too, when Chris says that this is really easy, he means it. We had two second graders from Cochrane Elementary, Jalen and Jordan Smith. They actually presented in VR in an international conference. And these second graders taught adults how to do exactly what Chris is doing right now. Yeah, in fact, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna dare say, Shannon, the kids do it better than I do. <laughs> They're so creative. So you can see that I've just pulled these images in off the web and uh, I can scale those images, place them where I want. Maybe I want to put them up as posters. And here's one, Shannon, I got of you when we were doing the little, uh, the project, the 360 project. That's a picture of your avatar right there. In fact, yep, you're wearing the same outfit. <laughs> All right, let me go ahead and delete those. And uh, one thing that's going on in, the, in VR right now that's a really big deal, it's called photogrammetry. And why that's such a big deal is because it's so accessible to people. You know, if you have an, one of the latest iPhones, you've got a great 3D scanner on there. I've got a Samsung phone that I can scan with. And the whole point of photogrammetry is bringing real world locations and objects into virtual reality to experience. Let me show you what that looks like. All right. Group. Okay, so um, in this case here, this is with one of our partners, River. They specialize in doing pho photogrammetry. This is an Abbey from the UK. And this is a big deal because a lot of, of uh, photo, uh, folks doing photogrammetry are capturing some of these sites that um, are being destroyed due to war or for whatever reason so that we can permanently create copies of those to experience anywhere. And you can see that I can scale that up. 
And I hope the frame rate's good on Zoom. It's super, super smooth when you're in the experience. And I can even scale that up to life size, which enables us to even just walk inside that experience. Come on in, Steven. Right? <laughs> And uh, let's see, I've got another one here as well. Here is an, the, the, uh, a memorial to the unknown soldier also located in the UK that they captured with photogrammetry. You can see, I mean, everything that you see here exists in the real world. Uh, we've done this with Mars, the Curiosity rovers captured all of those pictures which have been converted into photogrammetry. So I know when I'm standing on Mars, that pebble that I can get down and look at actually exists on the planet as though I'm there. So when we talk about VR, it really is teleporting our consciousness to a shared digital space. Go ahead I think Chris, while you're loading up something else, I'll just add to that. I mean, the whole point of this is, is really we're learning spatially, right? And we're providing access to things that fall outside of our paradigm, uh, but we're doing this spatially, right? So we're linking our key critical core senses, which is our hearing, sight, and on our touch or our kinesthetic action. And so we can do these things sort of it, as we would in, in, in the real world and they're within a realistic facsimile of whatever it is that we're trying to reproduce. It doesn't say, it suggests that we are going to replace real life. It's where appropriate, okay? And so that's some, one of the benefits of, of VR. And then you add the social component that we have here with Shannon, Chris, and myself. And now you have that ability to share this, this realistic experience. Absolutely. This is data taken from USGS data of Mount St. Helens. Um, actually, uh, Shannon brought this in and we, we were using this to teach topography where you could put a topographic map and slide it up and down the 3D model to show exactly how topography works, which is sometimes a hard concept to, to teach people. Um, but again, you know, this is just data uh, that we were able to import in. I mean, and again, we can scale that up and have some fun with that. Um, let me show you one other very important feature. It's our recording feature. We can yes. capture everything that we do in virtual reality spatially. So if a teacher wants to record a lesson, they can do that spatially. And then when people consume that content, it feels as though they are there for the original demonstration. Let me show you what that looks like. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go into our recording feature now. I'm so going to label while Chris is while Chris is loading it up, Chris, I'll just describe that. Just a yeah. quick parallel. By the way, I, guys, I just really quickly, I come from 20 years of K-12. Um, so as, a, as an educator practitioner myself, like what Chris is going to demonstrate is very much like lecture capture, right? So if you imagine a lecture happening, camera in the back, resources then put onto the LMS for students to rewatch or revisit if they didn't take play, part in it at all, it's there for them. This is exactly what's going to happen. If you were teaching in VR, Shannon and her students were doing this and there was a, you, students wanted to revisit this. They could. This is exactly like watching a YouTube video, except you're going to see it has volume, it's spatial, and it's, it's pretty, pretty interactive, um, even though it is a recording. All right. So here we go. I am uh, recording myself right now, and I just wanted to introduce you to this awesome 3D map of Mount St. Helens, which I can manipulate. And uh, welcome to class, everybody. Let's have some fun. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop that recording and save it. I'm gonna delete all of my items here. And we'll start fresh, go into my recording, load recording, and select it and play. Here we go. And there is no audio because he has his mic muted in here. So we weren't getting the double audio with Zoom, with the Zoom presentation, but it would have captured his audio as well. Absolutely, so there you go. In fact, I'll, I'll pause that right now. There we go. Um, so it's that easy. So we have like, we did this with Oxford University where we recorded uh, their lectures and then added all this amazing 3D content around those lectures to make it very compelling and exciting to experience. And lastly, let's go ahead and finish this off, Stephen. I'm gonna reload um, that volcano. Give me one sec and uh, yeah, here we go. So while you're loading that up, Chris, it's funny too. Please. Like, so I spent time uh, transitioning, you know, faculty from say Google Slides to, uh, excuse me, from PowerPoint to Google Slides, right? And so while those are very similar, it still was a challenge. And and so the question is, how easy is this? How difficult is this? It's difficult. Um, but as we move into this type of learning, and there are many reasons why beyond what we're describing here, you would want to use VR and leverage it for assessment and observation. Okay. Um, it is a difficult transition, so it is not as easy as bringing in clip art for those that are familiar with clip art. Uh, but once trained um, and you find those champions, 
you're going to find a lot of value in, in, in those teachers like Shannon has found in those that have really picked it, pick it up in, in her school, school districts. Stephen, if you want to pop on back up here where I am on the back stairs, I'm just, you know, since we're talking about volcanoes, I just threw this together like 10, literally 10 minutes this morning. It took me to do this. I'm going to take this volcano since we're in Pompeii. Let's throw this, let's enlarge this volcano. Let's throw it out here in the distance so we can see that volcano towering above the city and very easily using the existing um, IFX objects that we have, we can do some pretty fun stuff with that. Like, you know, it looks like that volcano is starting to show a little bit of smoke. Mm -hmm. And there we go. We'll throw a little fire and flame on there as well. And this is all being done real time. I'll quickly give the audience uh, a little glimpse as to what Chris is seeing when he's creating these things. So as he's bringing out 3D objects, this is the menu that he sees. Uh, on the PC, I'm on a PC, so I have exactly the same controls he has. But if I was to bring out, uh, say, a, a chicken, right, which is akin to any 3D object he's bringing out there, such as that um, uh, volcano, it's, it's the same thing, right? So I can bring this chicken out, scale it, and move it through the scene. Uh, but those are the tools that he is he's using uh, to not only interact with the space, but also to moderate the space. So in this particular case, I've muted Chris and Shannon. Uh, we can do other things like locking students in their seats if that is something. I, again, I come from K-12, so um, that is something I wish I had in real life. But, uh, you know, it's here in VR. Do we have uh, 90 more seconds? We could hop over real quick to the 360 theater, yes? I'll wait for an answer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I say go ahead, go ahead Chris. Okay, um, great. As we're doing that and we're wrapping it up, um, 90 seconds, like you said, okay, uh, I think it's here. important to note that um, Engage, the software is available on the desktop. So you don't have to have a headset to experience this type of virtual learning. Um, of course, yes, that is the goal for the um, highest level of presence, but students can be doing these type of things on those um, same computers that they're just sitting and watching in, in Zoom. So that's also a, a pretty yeah. Here. It's a really good point, Shannon. So like I said, I'm on a desktop, so it's great. We're also on Android mobile. We'll be on iOS beta um, by the end of the year and Mac desktop uh, 2D uh, by probably first quarter of next year. Don't quote me on that one, though. <laughs> uh oh, did I? No, nope, we are good. Let's uh, let's did just have a little fun. Hold on, Chris. Hold on, Chris. Did the sharing stop, guys? Oh, Sh Shannon, did, did the sharing stop? Oh, okay. I think so. Great. Okay, let's go ahead and, uh, you know, let's say we want to look at uh, how cars are manufactured. We can actually go to the Hyundai plant. Here we go. I'll stop the sharing because oh. we're getting ready to uh, wrap up. Ah. Okay. Oh, okay. No okay. worries. No worries. No worries. And I want to thank the committee for, for being here today. And um, as um, we started off with the music, um, wake up everybody. You know, no more sleeping in bed. You know, we have to look at forward thinking, you know, um, no, more, no more backwards thinking, time to think in ahead. And I think that was, um, Dr. Aaron Thompson, you said that I, I stole it out of your, um, out of your, uh, <laughs> your music collection, you know. But uh, again, um, uh, I thank all of you all for being here today because um, it is important that the constituents across the Commonwealth of Kentucky hear what the leaders are stating, what they're thinking, and where you're going with this. And so I want to, um, again, any parting words from anyone that um, would like to, as we go off, um, it's 1257 and I want to honor and respect your time. So if any parting words from um, anyone, um, I don't want to call anyone's name, but I, I can. <laughs> This is Jacqueline. Um, I'll just I'll just hop in and, and just say thank you. Uh, I think these conversations are so valuable. They're so needed. It's an opportunity for um, us to bring people together. And as mentioned before, our, our goal is to create that cradle to career pipeline across Kentucky. And that can't happen without conversations like these. So I look forward to hearing and, and more from from all of you and to learning as we listen. Absolutely, we have to work together collectively in order for this to happen. We need all hands on deck. You know? And so no one entity or institution can do this alone. We need everyone. Um, Dr. Polio, any parting words? Uh, no, just wanna say thank you. Great conversation again. I echo what the Lieutenant Governor said. I would just encourage us all. I think um, that if we want significant change in outcomes, we are gonna to have to do things differently. And I mean, very differently. And so, 
Um, I think we look at all the things that we do um, in the P20 pipeline um, and question those and say, are they um, achieving the goals that we want? Are they uh, increasing inequities that exist in our education system? So I would just encourage us to continue to have these conversations and to look deep into fundamental change. Thank, thank you. you. Dr. Thompson? Mm -hmm. You know, first of all, I want to thank everybody on this uh, Zoom call. Geneva, I want to thank you and your team for pulling this together. Uh, it's what a privilege it is to ha uh, work with Neela Bendapudi. I just want to tell you that personally, I, you're talking about quality, that's quality at the level that you want to talk about all the time. It's also good to work with these group of leaders who are dedicated to doing this. As they've heard me say over and over again, as I've heard them say that the time is now, we got the right group, let's do it. And so uh, I appreciate the conversation. I look forward to the next strategic process and uh, Geneva, keep doing the good work there. I, uh, uh, Amy and all you folk who are at Louisville doing this, know that we are very much on your team, on your side, and we'll be here for you when you need us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And more importantly for everyone, it's about the action. You know, what is going to be the action plan? Because we all have been a part of committees and workshops where there's been documents that have been, that are still placed on shelves, but what is going to be the action plan? And we have to be comfortable with people being uncomfortable in terms of moving the needle forward. We, there's going to be resistance, but we have to look at what do we, how do we move forward? And, and that's what we have to do. And sometimes it's about changing hearts and minds, but we cannot allow that to stop us from moving forward collectively um, as educators, because that's what our goal is, that we're preparing global citizens, global citizens. So not just uh, one specific group. So thank you again. Um, and any, um, anyone else have any parting words? Uh, then Dr. Stark, I just wanted to point out that um, the Nice Train Center is doing some pretty exciting things, especially collaborating with JCPS. And if anybody wants more information um, in regards to what we're doing, uh, on that flyer was our, um, you know, social media. They can also email us and we'd be more excited, more than happy to um, come collaborate and teach some people about VR and what we're doing. So they can reach out to my, especially they can reach out to me anytime and I'm happy to talk with anybody. So I just wanted to make sure people knew that. Thank you very much. Dr. Glass, Dr. Williams. Thanks to the University of Louisville for having this. Yeah, I would agree. You know, we, we are the change, right? All of us together. So Absolutely. appreciate the partners. Absolutely. We have to be the change we want to see. So have a um, great afternoon. And um, if you all have any questions or concerns, then you all have my information, then please um, reach back and um, we'll be continue to, um, to do the work with you all you know, as well. Bye-bye. <laughs>